Hi, today we're going to have a look at this dimmer switch which appears to have failed. Now it was installed at my parents house and it was controlling about five LED down lights and then it appeared to lose all ability to do any dimming. So we were still able to turn it off because it has a mechanical on off switch but no matter what position the dial was set to the lights just appeared to work as normal. So this is a very light VPro dimmer switch and it's one of the modules that you can buy to fit into grid modules. So this one has the MK grid uh, little plate here fitted, but it came with a whole range of different types. Um, so it literally comes out of the box like this. And these very light products are normally pretty high quality. Uh, I think this was installed about three years ago and they do have a 10 year warranty, but I have no idea where I bought it from. So I probably wouldn't have the proof of purchase to get it sorted out under warranty. And as you can see here, it's rated up to 10 lamps um, they specify the number of lamps because these LED lamps do have quite a capacitive loading, uh, but LED loading maximum 100 watts, and I think we're only loading it with about 42 watts or so. So well under the maximum limit, and those LED down lights are still working absolutely perfectly. So it's not like one of them failed and took out some of the switching devices. It does appear to be uh, entirely just down to this module failing in some way. So we've got the dimmer switch connected up to a incandescent lamp and when we turn it on it does illuminate but um, to the human eye it is actually flickering. It looks like it's lost half of the sine wave but we get no change in brightness really no matter what we do with the knob. Now we've got the picoscope connected up through the Mixig differential probe and when we turn it on you can see it does try and do some kind of soft start so something is still happening there but half of the waveform is missing. This bottom half is all distorted. I'm not really sure what's going on here. And we don't get any switching on this right hand side of the positive going part of the AC waveform. And if we change the brightness with the knob, you can see that something is still happening, but there's no visible reduction in brightness of the lamp. So these LED dimmers are a little bit more complicated than your traditional triac dimmer that used to be used for your basic incandescent lamps. And that's because we need to control the trailing edge of the AC waveform. So because the LED lamps present a capacitive load to the dimmer switch, if we try to turn them on partway through the AC waveform, because we're already at some high voltage up here, we'd see a really high peak current going into the capacitor that is after the bridge rectifier or whatever in your LED lamp. So instead we turn it on at the zero crossing point and then turn it off sometime later and then that allows the lamp to work more normally and it gets rid of all of those high peak currents. So the arrangement here is slightly different. So we've got our AC waveform coming in. It goes through that physical switch that was that push onto the dimmer knob. And then we basically have some kind of switching element. So a FET, uh, probably not a TRIAC in this case, or maybe an IGBT. And that basically closes the circuit and feeds the current into the lamp. And most of these dimmer switches will basically still power at different parts in the AC waveform. So they'll store some power in a capacitor in the dimmer switch to keep the electronics going. Most of these LED dimmers have some kind of microcontroller built in. So they want a nice smooth uh, 5 volts or 3.3 volts going into it. And we have this diode arrangement here, which basically provides us with a voltage here that then gets uh, dropped down with a zener diode. And that's generally how these work. Sometimes we'll see a couple of diodes added in in series with the switching element so that the microcontroller always gets some power and that also steals a little bit of power from the lamp and stops it ever achieving full brightness. But we've got a slightly weird situation here where the lamp seems to be partly working, the electronics seems to be partly working, um, but something is a bit weird going on with the switching element. Now some of you may remember my LED trailing edge dimmer project and this is one of the modules from this project. I did a whole series of videos refining this design. I think there's still a few things that I'd like to change on it. But this is the latest incarnation of one of the modules that I have made at our sponsor for today's video, JLC PCB. So don't forget to visit them if you're thinking about getting some low cost boards made. And these indeed were extremely cheap to get made there. But what we've got here switching the AC waveform for our LED load is a pair of MOSFETs. So it's this circuit here. It looks a little bit confusing at first, but basically if the MOSFETs are turned off, um, then on the positive going part of the AC waveform, 
current would normally go through here, but it gets blocked by the diode, blocked by the MOSFET, and so it may never makes it all the way through to turn on the lamp. However, if we do develop a voltage VGS here enough to turn on these two MOSFETs, then current flows through the two MOSFETs straight through to the lamp. Now, this uses two MOSFETs. However, if the cost of those two MOSFETs or the size on the PCB is too great, then there is actually a slightly more optimized method that you can use that just uses a single N-channel MOSFET. So it's using some of the uh, prop properties of the bridge rectifier. Obviously, there are some losses because now we've introduced some voltage drop through these diodes. But on the positive part going of the AC waveform, if this MOSFET is turned off, then the current would normally go in this direction. Blocked by this diode, it would go this direction and it wouldn't be able to turn on the lamp. And because the uh, MOSFET's not conducting, it also wouldn't go any other route. So the lamp would be turned off. However, if we put our voltage VGS here enough to turn on the MOSFET, then current would go through here, through the diode, through the MOSFET, and then through this diode, this side, and through the lamp. And then on the other part of the AC waveform, it would go the other way, through the lamp, through this diode, through the MOSFET in the correct direction, and then back through here, through to the AC source. So we're able to switch AC with a single N-channel MOSFET. Now, the waveform to me suggests that either if they've gone for two MOSFETs in this dimmer switch, one of them has failed in some way. Um, and if they've used the bridge rectifier method, then probably one of the diodes has failed in the bridge rectifier because we saw it able to switch the AC waveform on one part of it, it was still working. So this MOSFET definitely still works. And we're in, and what I can see here is, yeah, we've just got the one switching device, a MOSFET or something here, and we can see a bridge rectifier here. So I think we need to go a little bit deeper. It looks like the MOSFET and the bridge rectifier were soldered in after assembly from what I can see. So we might need to desolder these points here and the PCB should then come off and we can then test the bridge rectifier and that MOSFET. So I did actually manage to get it out uh, just by unscrewing the heatsink part, but there's an impossible nut. So we can't assemble it without desoldering the MOSFET. So let's start by doing that. Uh, we've got a bit of wick here. And also we've got the Ursa station, which has a nice fat tip already installed on it and we'll use a bit of wick here just to get rid of the solder and it looks like they've actually folded the legs back on themselves during the assembly process so might have to have a little fiddle here to get those straightened out So that's the MOSFET out, but I noticed there's a thermal fuse that was pressed against that MOSFET. I don't know if that's a resettable one, I have to look at the part number, but maybe we've just tripped that. And it looks like that fuse is still intact, so we're in luck there. So this isn't actually a MOSFET, it is actually a little IGBT, rated for 7 amps at 600 volts. So we've got the peak tester here, the semiconductor tester, so we should be able to hook this up and see what it says about it. Looks like the screen's gone a bit funny on here, but it does detect it as an enhancement mode IGBT. I'm not sure if it's showing up very well on camera. Yeah, this graphic display has gone a bit funky on here. But you can read what it's saying. And yeah, the pins line up. So that is suggesting that, as I thought, the switching element is working fine. Let's take a look at the bridge rectifier instead. So just looking a little bit closer at the PCB before I start desoldering anything, across the positive and negative part of the bridge rectifier, we've got this little metal oxide varista. And then if you look at the tracers, one goes through these current sense resistors to the IGBT 
and then that other pin um, if it focuses goes to the other pin on the RGBT so it's exactly the same arrangement that we had here only instead of a MOSFET we've got the RGBT and we've also got a metal oxide varistor across it to help protect it from any surges and then also we have this resettable thermal fuse in series so they've chopped the leg off here and connected it in series to the PCB on the AC terminal of the bridge rectifier so basically it will just literally cut this line here when the device is overheating so we'll test that with the meter and yeah a dead short we should be able to flip the polarity around and it still be a short yeah there we go so that's what's causing the problem and so we've got a faulty bridge rectifier so I'll see if I've got any in this particular size I'm not sure if I do Right, so I've got one here. It's exactly the same size and part number, so that's quite lucky. And what we'll do is exactly the same modification to what they've done here with this thermal fuse. So we're going to need to desolder this. Now, having looked up the part number, WR115, this is actually a non-resettable thermal fuse. So we're going to have to be a little bit careful desoldering this. Probably I will grab a little test clip or something like that to heat sink some of the heat away from the thermal fuse itself because as you can see it looks like they wrapped the wire around the pin on the bridge rectifier a couple of times so we are going to have to apply a little bit of heat to this joint. Right, so we've got the system set back up again. I have had to swap out the lamp for an LED one this time because I can't find where I temporarily placed the incandescent one. Uh, but it is designed to drive LED lamps anyway. So uh, the incandescent one just makes it a little bit easier to troubleshoot because this can introduce all kinds of artifacts in the waveform. Now, there shouldn't be too much that can go wrong here in that the dimmer switch itself has no neutral connection. So if it decides to fail internally, Either it will fail open circuit and the lamp won't light up, it will fail short circuit and the light will just light up normally. If it does fail in some other way, the maximum amount of current that will flow is about 45 milliamps because that's the rating of this lamp. So we shouldn't really see any fires or anything like that as well. So we should be able to power this up and see whether it's worked or not. And that looks like it's probably working. Let's turn it up and down. And yeah, back to normal behaviour. So that all seems to be working properly. So in the end, it was a fault in the bridge rectifier. One of the diodes had shorted and it meant that the lamps weren't working properly. And also the electronics wasn't able to work properly because it was fully conducting when it actually needed a bit of power in that part of the AC waveform. So possibly not the most interesting repair, but we have saved another item from landfill. Uh, you know, even if I sent this back for repair, all they would have done is thrown it away and sent me out a new one. So at least we've repaired it and saved it from that. Also, I think that circuit was quite interesting. So what I might end up doing is making a new module for my uh, AC dimmers using that same type of circuit and see how it compares to the dual MOSFET circuit that I've been using. Uh, see whether it only reduces the bomb cost or whether it introduces any other benefits and we can have a look at the waveforms together and see how they both look so I think that might be an interesting investigation to do I have got some of those IGBTs so uh, we can run that test even though a lot of them are out of stock at the moment uh, with no delivery date so we should be able to get that done quite quickly so anyway I hope you enjoyed the video big thank you to JLC PCB for sponsoring this video don't forget to visit them if you're thinking about getting some boards made big thank you to all my patreon supporters who are really helping to keep the channel going if you've got any thoughts or comments leave them in the comments section down below until next time thanks for watching